<clears throat> Howdy, and welcome back. Let's recap week number four of dynamics, shall we? We previously talked about systems of particles, and we had described how particles interact. So if you have two particles, you know, mass one, mass two, and you have them connected by a spring or a string or something else, we had seen that we can reformulate linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance, and the work energy balance for the system. And we used those equations already last week to solve problems. Now we looked at two particular cases this past week, which come in addition to what we discussed before. And the first one is a collision of particles. So what happens if two particles collide? And if we have a collision, then we're essentially taking two particles and smashing them into each other. So the first one over here, let's say, comes in with some velocity v1, which it has prior to impact particle 2, comes in with some different velocity v2 prior to impact at t minus, and then here they collide, right? And at this point, something happens, they exchange forces, they possibly exchange linear momentum, and this is what we discussed. One of the most important points is there is not a single external force acting on the particles during impact. Even if there's gravity acting, we can usually neglect this because during the very brief moment of impact, this force between the particles is much more important than gravity or anything else that's constantly acting all the time. So if these two particles come together and we only look at these tiny instants during which they collide, there's really no external force that matters, which means these two have no external forces applied. And what that means as a system, we know that linear momentum is conserved. So we look at the total linear momentum, meaning mass 1 times velocity 1 plus mass 2 times velocity 2. This thing remains constant during the collision because they only exchange forces with each other, but not necessarily with the environment because of this linear momentum is conserved. So if we know the velocity is prior to impact, we know that this thing here must remain constant. That doesn't necessarily tell us the velocity is after the impact, but, and you know, this is where some assumptions come in, what we discussed is that if you have these two particles, and let's say they're hitting each other, then as before, we can define, this is my M1 and M2, we can define this plane between the two particles we assume that, of course, these are particles, so one has to be a little careful with the exact assumptions. But if this is the plane at which they're meeting up, then we can always define our normal component and our tangential component. And we define our vectors in these directions. And if this is the case, we can again look at the velocity components normal and tangential to this plane of impact. And if this collision here is frictionless, which is what we usually assume in our case, they're smooth particles. And then what we discussed was that as before, the tangential velocity of either of the two particles does not change. And note that we made a slight change in notation here because the many indices became confusing. We put the tangential t to the top so that we could say either particle one or two in the subscript. And so here I'm gonna say i, where i is either particle one or two, this before impact is the same as that after impact. Because as before, the tangential component is not changed by the impact because of the assumption of no friction between the two particles. The normal component does change, right? And the normal component does change because of the collision in general. And so what we have seen here is for V of particle I equals one or two and the normal component afterwards, well, this one is a bit more complicated. It depends on the two initial velocities of the particles, normal prior to impact, and of course on the masses. I'm just going to say dot 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 because this relation is given in the lecture notes and it's given in the formula collection. So if you want to know the velocity after impact in the normal component, you can just look it up in the lecture notes and the class notes and the formula collection and use it wherever you need to. The one thing I want to add here is that these velocities after impact will again depend on the coefficient of restitution e. Remember how for a single particle it had to do with the velocity against the wall compared to the velocity with which it was leaving from the wall. Here it's something very similar. It also has a minus sign in it and by our definition what it is is we call it v2 normal after impact minus v1 normal after impact divided by v2 normal before impact minus v1 normal, uh, sorry, these are after impact 
and these down here are both before impact. And this we can also physically interpret. What this here above the bar in the numerator is in the, in the numerator is this is nothing else but the relative separation distance of the two particles. It's the normal component of the velocity of the two particles. They're leaving again. What we do here is we take these two normal velocities of particle one and two and subtract them from each other. So this is the relative velocity at which the two particles are separating. And this down here, of course, is the analogous, but just before. So this is nothing else but the relative velocity with which the two particles were coming against each other. And so what this does is it relates the velocity at which the particle are first meeting to the relative velocity at which the particles are leaving again. And so in that sense, it's very, very similar to what we did for the particle hitting a wall. Right? If one of the particles is a wall, this would be there and we just recover our original definition. And this we can use to solve collision problems like pool billiard or whatnot. The one thing we can also solve with at least the general concept here is what happens if the particle loses mass or gains mass. That's what we call the rocket equation for mass loss or mass accretion. And so let me lift this down here as the rocket equation. What we discussed there is imagine you have a particle and this particle is either losing mass, so the little piece is falling off as it moves, right? So if you go this way, this is what we would call mass loss. And of course, if the particle is going in the opposite direction, if it's moving this way, this is, for example, the scenario where a particle is moving through wet, damp air and is picking up water particles as it moves. And so in this case, we speak about mass accretion. The mass changes over time. And in these two cases, we saw that we have to modify linear momentum uh, balance a little bit. And in particular, if this is a particle over here, what we've seen is that if at a certain instance this has a mass m, and this m is changing, so m is now a function of time, then the governing equation, which is lmb in this particular case, states that the sum of all forces, this is like before, equals mass times acceleration. That's also the same as before, but if the mass is changing, there's an extra term which comes in. This extra term is plus m dot, the rate of change of mass, times the velocity of the particle, minus the velocity of the extra mass being added, where this little m refers to all these little dots here. Right? All these are being added, these are little dm's, if you will, little differential mass particles that are thrown on top of the big particle or taken away. And these may have a velocity, which may not necessarily be the same as the velocity of the particle. Imagine that this is particle is moving through damp air, in which case these particles are initially just standing still when the particle hits them. So in that particular case, the velocity of the particle is v, the particles have a velocity of zero. This would be gone, right, the second term. However, if you know, you're moving, and these little particles are coming towards you. They have an initial velocity. And this term here is then nothing else but the difference of the two. is the relative velocity of the particle with respect to whatever is being added. Or we can also say it this way. This is minus the relative velocity of that little dm over here. I'm going to write it this way. The little mass that's being added or taken away from your particle. And this is known as a rocket equation because, of course, a prime application is rocket science. If the rocket leaves, the gas that comes out, that's mass, which the rocket is losing. And that's exactly the second term. In fact, that's the one that allows the rocket to lift off, as we'll see in some of the problems. All right, so that's everything we discussed about particles. And um, I need to make a little jump here because this past week we also talked about Rigid bodies, let me move over here. This is really for the second half of the exercise. And so here we discussed that we don't have to treat everything as a particle anymore, but we can also talk about what we call rigid bodies. When we have a rigid body, we assume it's no longer a tiny particle, but this thing has an actual size. It has a shape um, and it has a 3D extension. So this will have a total mass, capital M, at every point, it has a mass density rho of x. And no matter what this looks like, we can always calculate what we call the center of mass 
just like for a system of particles from what we know from statics. We can calculate the center of mass of any body uh, in 3D. And these guys are moving now. They have more degrees of freedom than particles because this thing can translate and it can also rotate. So if we're in 3D, we'll have a total of six degrees of freedom, three translations and three rotations. If we're in 2D, we'll have three degrees of freedom, you know, two translations and two rotations. Then what we did discuss is that in general, we have to consider now translations and rotations. And these rotations are something we have to be a little careful about because they are somehow new to us. Of course, a lot of this is known to many of you from statics, and kinematics, mechanics one, but those especially who did not take mechanics one should pay careful attention to what we're doing here. What we also saw is that everybody that's moving through space at every instance of time can always have a unique angular velocity omega attached to it. And this may be changing over time, but what we can always say is that there's always a unique omega for a given body. And this unique omega vector allows us to express the velocities of two points, it lets us relate the velocity of two points to each other. In particular, what we've seen is that the velocity of any point B on the body is nothing else but the velocity of any point C on the body. So you pick two arbitrary points, B and C. And of course, they're not the same, so we need to add something, and that something is omega cross, and now we need the vector which goes from C to B. So it looks like that. This is what we call the velocity transfer formula. It allows us to transfer from any point C to any point B or vice versa on the body by using this construction over here. It also allows us to do one more thing. It allows us to define the instantaneous center of rotation, or ICR. In German, that is the Momentanpol. And so what this means is that if you have a certain body, right, then at any instance in time, of course, this thing is translating through space and it's also rotating. And now imagine we add these two. Let's say this is moving as a rigid body. right? And so what this means is every single point may somehow have the same velocity. This will be a rigid body translation. Every single point moves with the same velocity. If it's also rotating, that means we throw some rotation on top, maybe like this. And now if we extrapolate, we can always find a point. This is what we call the instantaneous center of rotation. Now we also call it pi. And the specialty about this point, which in general is also moving through space, is that the velocity of any point on the body can be expressed as a pure rotation. So we can here say that the velocity of any point on the body is the velocity of the instantaneous center of rotation zero plus omega cross and here we need the vector which goes from the instantaneous center of rotation so from pi to the point so if this is point b for example it would be just that and this allows us to uniquely find also this point and we can see that for example if we start from any point b if we know the velocity at this point b here now let's call this vb then we can back calculate and we can find the location, the vector which goes from this point B to the instantaneous center of rotation as 1 over the angular velocity times E3, the vector out of the plane, cross, and here we need the vector, uh, sorry, the velocity of that point B. And this instantaneous center of rotation is very helpful because we can very often need this when we solve problems. Let me just give you one example. Now, let's say we have a body that looks whatever, like that, and this is moving through space. And now let's assume that we know the velocity, for example, let's say at this point, the velocity is pointing that way, and at this point down here, the velocity is pointing that way. What we do know is that the instantaneous center of rotation always lies on a line perpendicular to the velocity. And so all I have to do here is now draw lines which are perpendicular to the velocity vectors, and they go through the point where the velocity is defined, and the intersection of those has to be the instantaneous center of rotation. Once I know the instantaneous center of rotation, I can also find the velocity of any other point. So if you want to know where this guy is going, all I need to do is draw again a line through the instantaneous center of rotation to the point, and from this I can calculate the velocity of any arbitrary point. And that's the power of this instantaneous center of rotation. Note that this point pi, it does not have to lie on the body. It can be anywhere in space, just like here. 
and in principle it can be anywhere else at any instance of time. Here we discussed only the 2D relations. Next week we'll see how this works in 3D and we'll also apply this more generally to a whole bunch of problems. With this I'm going to end. Uh, see you next time and ciao!